Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to remind you all that we are always welcoming suggestions for Food for Soup speakers or topics. So please drop us an email if you have any suggestions at foodforsoup at food.gov.uk. So today's talk is from Professor Andrew Salter, who has worked at the University of Nottingham since 1984 and is based in the Division of Food, Nutrition, Dietetics and in the School of Biosciences uh, on the Sutton Bonington campus. He's a registered nutritionist. He served elected honorary scientific officer and trustee of the Nutrition Society since 2012 to, to 2018. He's currently a trustee of the Academy of Nutrition Science He's worked extensively on the molecular mechanism whereby diet impacts on lipid metabolism and metabolic disease, particularly cardiovascular disease. But in parallel, he's also developed a research portfolio looking at the sustainable production of healthy foods to meet the demands of the expanding and aging global population. He currently leads the Future Protein Platform. That's a one million investment from the Future Foods Bacon at the University of Nottingham. And the aim of this project is to evaluate novel systems for production of novel protein sources, in plants, single cell organisms and insects, to assess their nutritional value and to develop their use as human food and animal feeds. We are very pleased that he's accepted to come to speak to us about the role of novel protein sources in sustainably meeting future requirement. And right before I hand over to Andy, I will remind you the housekeeping rules. Since we are on team live, you will not be able to unmute your microphone to ask questions, but you will be able to post these in the Q&A chat on the right of your screen. Please feel free to post questions whenever you like, but do note that we will not cover these until uh, the end of the talk when I will read them out for Andy to answer. And finally, please note that this uh, seminar is being recorded. So now over to Andy. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you to the Food Standards Agency for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And as Karen said, my title is The Role of Novel Protein Sources in Sustainably Meeting Future Requirements. Um, I recognise that I may have quite a diverse audience in terms of expertise. So what I intend to do is to spend a little bit of time setting the background to some of our research and then spend a little bit of time uh, actually describing uh, in a little bit more detail some of the research we've actively been doing. Um, I realise that this platform uh, is limited in terms of in the way we can interact, so if anybody has any more detailed questions which I can't answer at the end, do feel free to contact me on the email address which is showing on the slide at the moment, and I'll do my, my best to get back to you as uh, soon as possible. So, by way of background, um, probably for many of you who are working within the government sector, you'll be well aware of uh, this document, which came out uh, back in the uh, summer of last year, uh, the, uh, the plan from the National Food Strategy by uh, Henry Dimbleby. And this really reflects a growing interest in the need to transform uh, our whole food system to a certain extent, but uh, there are specific um, recognition in there of a need to transform protein. And the areas that Henry Dimbleby uh, highlighted was an investment in technology to re reduce methane production by ruminants, um, an investment in alternative proteins that can replace some animal products, and then trying to nudge com consumer behaviour uh, through the public sector procurement uh, systems. It's really the middle section of that that I'm going to focus on, the uh, alternative protein side, but not only in replacing animal products, but in helping us to produce animal products. I think we all have to recognise that for the foreseeable future, there is likely to be a livestock industry, uh, and that is having a major impact on our environment. And we can make that more sustainable by changing the nature of, of the protein we're actually feeding to the animals themselves. So why do we need novel protein sources? Well, just very briefly, 
we have to remember that still in in some of the lowest income parts of the world, people are still struggling to meet their minimum requirements. And even in higher income countries, there will be um, parts of those societies which are also uh, the poorest and, 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 and struggling. And we have to think about not only the amount of protein which is available for those people, but also the quality. In high income countries, uh, we have the opposite in many ways, and many people are eating uh, considerably more protein than they actually need. Uh, and over recent decades, that's often been promoted as a perceived health benefit, perhaps wrongly for the vast majority of the uh, population. Um, the production of protein, particularly protein of animal origin, has a major impact on the environment. And I've already talked about the recognition of the effect of um, ruminant production of cows in particular in producing methane, which is a major greenhouse gas. But there are other factors as well. The production of food for our livestock takes up an immense amount of land, an immense amount of water, and those, that, that, those livestock contribute significantly to the pollution of both our land and our waterways. The global population continues to grow, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, and indeed the global population and particularly the population again of the higher income countries is getting considerably older. So taking all that into account, how are we going to sustainably, sustainably produce sufficient high protein, protein, high quality protein, sorry, to feed the global population? For those of you who are not working in the area, let me just say a little bit more about what I mean by protein quality in particular. The World Health Organization suggests that the adult safe protein intake is something like 0.83 kilograms of pro sorry, not, not 0.83 grams per kilogram of body weight. Different countries have slightly different uh, values for requirements. I think in the UK, uh, the uh, reference nutrient intake is about 0.75, so it's quite close to that. But let's stick with the World Health uh, recommendations for now. This is generally based on consuming quite high quality protein. It also makes it clear that there are high requirements for children uh, and for pre pregnant and lactating women. Uh, protein quality depends on two major uh, factors associated with the food that you're eating. One is, of course, the amino acid composition of the protein you're consuming. Um, and that is that it contains an appropriate amount of all the essential amino acids, those we can't actually uh, make ourselves. But on top of that, there's also the question of digestibility uh, of, uh, of that protein. And many plant sources uh, have, uh, have particular problems, some related to the physical nature of the protein, but also the presence of compounds which we call anti-nutrients, such as phytate and uh, and various inhibitors which can impede that digestion of uh, the protein and indeed impede the, the digestion of other uh, nutrients, particularly minerals. I think it's fair to say that in general, animal proteins, whether that's eggs, fish, meat, dairy, are regarded as the highest quality dietary protein uh, within our food system, both in terms of the amino acid composition and digestibility. That's not to say that there aren't some high quality uh, plant sources around as well. And I'm not trying to say we have to eat animal proteins. If we have access to a wide variety of plant sources, I think we're all well aware now that we can uh, have a very healthy diet which maintains health for a long life uh, li lifespan. I mentioned the, uh, the, the rising global population and um, this is just some estimates I've made of the requirements which are going to be for protein because of that rising global population. So using UN estimates of the increase in population, look, using the World Health Organization uh, safe protein intakes for the various countries and predicting what might be happening. And the blue line right at the top is the global estimate of protein requirement. And as you can see, there's going to be a steady increase in requirements if those uh, population estimates are, are correct toward right up to the end of this century. However, you can see that that is very disproportionate. At the moment, the majority of protein uh, in the world is consumed uh, in Asia. That's going to remain uh, quite steady. 
And what we're going to see is a massive increase in requirement in a growing population uh, on the African continent, the red line that you can see there. And the rest of us uh, are all bunched at the bottom there, but I'll say more about that at the moment. So while I recognise that many on the call's primary interests are in uh, the UK food systems and our own requirements for protein, it is important to put that in the context of, a of, of the global situation. And the biggest increase in need for protein is going to be in Africa. And this slide highlights the scale of that problem. This looks at the protein availability across the world, a little bit out of date, but uh, it's still similar, I believe. And on the left hand side there, you see the total amount of protein available per person per day in the whole world. And, and the entirety of the bar you see goes considerably above that line I've added, which is the daily requirement for a 70 kilogram adult, which is often used as a base. And you can see that there's, that there's more protein available than actually uh, everybody on the planet needs. However, that is not equally distributed across the world, of course. And you move to the next bar and you see the potential problem in Africa. They're very close to that, uh, that, that, that dietary requirement that I've added there already. That which means considerable numbers of people are, are already deficient in, in protein. If we add to that the growing population, we can see the potential problem which has got to be resolved for that particular continent. As we move across the graph, we see uh, increasing amounts of protein available in America, in Europe, in, in um, Oceania, and you can see well above the requirements. But one immediate thought is, if, well, if we just redistribute that protein some, some, somewhat, then we could solve potentially that problem in the poorer parts of the world. However, the other thing you see from here is that the bars are, are divided up in the sources of protein uh, and divided up in terms of uh, whether they're from plant sources and from animal sources. And again, if you look at Africa first, you see that the majority of protein is coming from plant sources, uh, with the yellow part of the bar being the cereals, being the major source of protein. And often that is one of the lowest quality sources of protein, which again is a problem. If we move to the other side, as we increase the amount of protein which is available in other parts of the world, you see an increasing proportion of animal proteins, of meat and of dairy in particular, and to a lesser extent of fish. Now, much of what I'll be talking about will be talking, will, will include the need for us to reduce that uh, reliance on animal protein. And as we do that, obviously, then if we don't replace it with alternative high quality uh, uh, components, then we potentially uh, could, could have problems. So a, an unequal distribution of protein around the world and an over-reliance perhaps on those proteins which are derived from animal products. Just want to spend a little bit of time before I move on to talk uh, about uh, problems closer to home on a little bit of the research we've been doing uh, regarding uh, this problem potentially in Africa. And uh, with colleagues, we've been looking specifically at uh, one of the poorest African countries in Malawi. And we've used a recent household survey to look at protein availability in, uh, in, in, in Malawi. And we've looked at it by household. And here, what's called SEP1, the, 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 the left-hand bar, are the poorest households and set five, the, the right hand bars, are the, are the richest households within that country. You can see that the whole country is very dependent on cereal crops for their protein. Uh, and that dependency is highest in the poorest households and tends to decline as income increases. And I can say further that the main cereal crop that uh, this population is uh, dependent on is maize which again has particular problems in terms of the protein quality. Uh, as we get richer, if you move to the center of the graph, you see in animal products, uh, the richer households have uh, more access to animal products than the poorer households. In terms of the risk of deficiency, uh, this is also seen to be much worse, quite, quite obviously in the poorer households than the richest ones. The blue bar here, on the left hand side, on the left hand side graph, first of all, just shows the proportion of people who are likely to be 
uh, deficient of total protein and about 40% of those poorest households. However, we've, what we've also done is looked at the available data on protein digestibility. And I'll talk about some of the problems in measuring that later. Uh, and if you take into account the, the digestibility of the protein, particularly the digestibility of the maize they're consuming, that increases even further. And we see that deficiency goes up to 60% of those households. On the graph on the right hand side, we've looked at one of the essential amino acids, lysine, which is often the most deficient in human diets. And sure enough, that problem is even worse in terms of total protein, 60% of the poorest income being deficient, that going up to over 80% if we look at the available lysine, that which is, uh, is digestible and, uh, and, and can be taken into the body. Uh, just out of interest, um, the grey bar here is one possible solution. I mean, I think ultimately what we'd like to see is a greater diversity of protein sources for this population, but one possible solution is just to change the variety of maize that uh, is being grown in this country. And this has been done in other countries around the world. And there's a particular type called quality pr protein maize, which has been bred to specifically try and address some of these problems. And theoretically, if we were to replace all of the maize which has been grown in, uh, in Malawi, then we'd see a significant drop in the number of people who are protein deficient. Still, too high, but one possible uh, quite simple solution to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to publish this data. The paper is just about to go off to, uh, to, a, to a journal for consideration for publication. So that's the problem in some of the poorest parts of the world. Let's move a little bit closer to home and let's look at uh, what's happening in the UK. In that graph I showed you of protein requirements, uh, Europe was way, way down that graph, as you say, but if we look in a little bit more detail at our own country, we see there will be a modest increase in protein requirements, the yellow bar at the top of the graph there. However, that is almost entirely due to one demographic within our country, and that is the oldest uh, demographic, those people over 65, as you can see. Um, younger people and uh, younger adults is staying pretty static, but there's that quite almost doubling in the protein needs of that older population. The uh, pie chart on the other side is taken from the National Diet Survey, the, uh, the most recent data that we've got there, and it really reflects what we see for most of the uh, UK population at the moment, that we have a big dependency at the moment on animal sources of protein, about two thirds of the protein requirement of this elderly group, uh, is from animal products, from milk, from meat, uh, uh, and uh, from fish and eggs. Uh, and then the, another 22% is coming from cereals. The other thing I'd highlight here is the uh, amount which is coming from nuts and seeds. There's a lot of uh, information out there and suggestions that we should be using these as a relatively high quality protein source much more. But I think this uh, graph really shows us the size of the task in getting people to change their diets because only 2% of the protein intake from this particular age group in the UK is actually coming from those sources at the moment. The increase in the number of older people and the increase in the proportion of protein they require uh, raises specific problems. Uh, this again is taken from uh, the graph on the left hand side is taken from the National uh, Diet and Nutrition Survey. Uh, but here, what I've done is take the requirements of the World Health Organization, but I've also added what is seen as an increasing need that uh, we should actually increase the requirements for older people. And there's a nice review which I've, uh, uh, I've referenced there at the bottom of the slide, which uh, looks at the evidence of this. And it's quite persuasive that really the absolute requirements as we get older actually increase and the safe level should perhaps be increased to something like uh, 1.1 or 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight. So if we add that to the existing requirements and then look at what's going on in uh, the UK from the National Diet Survey, you can see on the left hand side that in younger age groups, the green arrow is indicating the requirement all of those are co relatively comfortably within those requirements, but again, very dependent on animal sourced proteins. 
As we move to the right hand side of the graph, however, we see if we take this increased requirements of the elderly, then we find that in fact intakes are already are cons are already considerably below that apparent safe intake. Uh, if, you if we were to start to remove the animal products with from that without replacing them with high quality sources of protein, then that could get potentially worse. And there are considerable concerns about this in terms of maintaining health during age, in, in terms of maintaining muscle mass during age. Uh, it really a combination of exercise and protein intake are vital to try and uh, uh, remain healthy throughout our aging. So we've got a specific problem perhaps in the high income countries of ensuring uh, a consistent supply of high quality protein for the elderly. Uh, and as we potentially move away from our, our, our reliance on animal sources proteins, we need to take into consideration this demographic perhaps in particular, as well as low safe socioeconomic groups. And uh, there's also some suggestion of some uh, problems potentially in, uh, in adolescence. Just as a slight aside, when I was looking at this data, I also looked at the uh, current uh, red and processed meat consumption uh, uh, from uh, the National uh, Diet and Nutrition Survey. Uh, a lot of emphasis on this and a lot of emphasis on our reducing our intake of red and processed meat for both health reasons, the links with cardiovascular disease and certain cancers, uh, particularly colon cancer, and for environmental reasons, a lot of uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of publicity and a lot of uh, uh, of information relating to the impact, as I said, of cows in particular in producing methane, which is quite important to greenhouse gas. It's quite, I mean, I think we haven't perhaps recognised what has actually happened though, because if we look at the National Diet Survey and we look at the average intake of the different age groups, as you can see here, uh, we have actually reduced our red meat, red and processed meat consumption below the level which is uh, um, estimated in the Eat Well Guide. So the, the Eat Well Guide, of course, is the, uh, is, is the guidance which is used to, uh, to inform most public health uh, nutrition policy in the UK. The suggestion is we shouldn't be eating more than 70 grams of red and processed meat a day. And the average that you can see there is considerably below that. However, Perhaps the biggest feature of, of this whole graph is the vast standard deviation we've got there, indicating the vast range we've got in most of these age groups and, in, and across the genders in terms of the intake, with a significant proportion of the population consuming far more than that uh, requirement and a significant proportion consuming uh, considerably less. Uh, I put this up just to highlight, however, perhaps again, and particularly in the older females, that they are already well below the, uh, the, 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 the requirement on average and further decreases could influence that problem I was talking about in ensuring that our elderly population gets sufficient high quality protein to maintain their health. OK, so what I want to move on to now is the problems which are associated with animal based proteins. And I've talked about consistently that uh, there is a general consensus that we should be reducing our consumption of these some for health reasons, but a lot increasingly for environmental reasons. This is what I like to call the global protein balance sheet, and it looks at where all the protein that we're producing is going across the world. And on the left hand side, we have a big yellow part of the bar, which is all of the edible crops that we produce. And then on top, we have the green bit, the pasture, generally not seen as a major source of protein for direct consumption. Uh, by people, uh, uh, but obviously goes into our food chain for feeding particularly ruminant animals. On the right hand side, the blue part of the bar is the requirement um, that we have for the global population. And you can see that we comfortably, in fact, almost four times as much edible pro protein is produced than we need to feed the whole population but we're not feeding that directly to people. A large proportion of that is going into animal feed. So our land and our water resources are being used to produce these crops to actually produce feed for animals. And as you move to what I've called post harvest, you see that large chunk of animal feed that of course includes the pasture as well, but it also includes a big chunk of the edible crops. We've also at the bottom got uh, the waste there. 
So from that, all of those edible crops were growing. You can see in that post harvest, the yellow bar has gone down considerably. That is what's moving forward into our, um, our food systems. Obviously, the animals are producing protein, which we can consume. And when we go to the pre-processing level there, you see that added on to the crops that we're eating. And that's the food which is available. But animals are not that efficient. And that green part of the bar in the pre-processing is the animal losses. The losses that we're seeing throughout the lifetime of the animal as it's growing and the losses associated with parts of the carcass that we don't eat. So in the end, we have that red and yellow bit of the pre-processing going forward into the human diet, still comfortably meeting our requirements uh, and in many parts of the world, as I say, uh, meeting that excess intake that we're seeing, further waste as well as you can see there. But as you can see, the production of animal uh, protein is a highly inefficient pro process and it's having a major impact on our environment and that's the main reason why we're seeing the call for uh, reducing our, um, our, our dependence on animal protein in the human diet. So how do we reduce that dependence? And how do we re reduce specifically the impact of protein production on the environment? Well, in those areas of the world where we're consuming considerably excess animal derived protein, the simplest thing is for us to reduce it. Uh, and where needed, we can replace that animal protein with alternative, uh, more sustainable sources. But I think most of us recognise that for the foreseeable future, there will be continue to be uh, a livestock industry and, and many people will still be dependent on it to a certain extent. And we can make that more sustainable by changing what we're feeding the animals as well. And that's mainly uh, those two things that are what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk. And so, as uh, Karen mentioned, I'm leading something called the, 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 the Future Protein Platform at Nottingham, uh, a university funded uh, uh, research project through our uh, beacon, uh, food beacon of excellence, looking specifically at alternative sources of protein, both for human food and also for use as animal feed. Our work at the moment very much focuses on the nutritional aspects of this, but we have to take keep in, 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 into account other aspects, things like the safety of what we're producing, uh, both either for the, uh, the animals we're feeding it or directly for humans. It has to be affordable, it has to be scalable, it has to be sustainable, and ultimately it has to be acceptable to the consumer. The first thing that we've concentrated on is trying to find a way of screening the protein quality of, or the quality of the proteins that we're actually producing. Back in 1913, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization recommended that globally we adopt a measure of protein quality called the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score, or DIAS, for determining protein quality. And this is based on the availability of essential amino acids at the end of our small intestine, at the end of the ileum, before it enters the uh, colon, where it would mix with the uh, microbiome, the bacteria there, and be diluted out to a certain extent by, by those, the, the, those proteins. However, it is not easy to directly measure this in people. Getting samples of the amino acids which are leaving the small intestine can be invasive, it's expensive, uh, we're constantly looking at, try, at trying to develop ways of doing it, but we have very limited data on the DIAS score of different protein sources in people directly. Much of the data we used and the data that we, I used in when I was looking at the uh, quality of the protein in those Malaysian studies, for example, not sorry, Mal Malawian studies, for example, is based on animal data. And in general, the pig is regarded as the next best model, and we have quite a good database for the pig because of uh, the interest in, uh, in pig nutrition uh, in farming. If not the pig, then the rat. And we also have some data in the chicken, but then we're moving quite a long way from the digestive system of humans. Because of this, there's been an increasing interest in developing a reliable uh, in vitro system for screening the um, uh, the, the, the digestibility of protein potentially in humans. And uh, we've been working with a group called Infogesta, an international network, trying to standardize a system 
for measuring um, potential uh, digestibility of protein in an in vitro system, essentially in a test tube or in three test tubes, as the diagram suggests. We try and model each of the phases of the digestive tract, the mouth, the oral phase, the stomach, the gastric phase, and then moving into the intestinal phase uh, and, uh, and, and the digestion and what comes out of there. Um, we're working on what's called a static system. There's also a, a, what we call a semi-dynamic system, which then, then tries to take into account the, the movements of the gut as well. Uh, but we're trying to develop a system where we can quite rapidly screen novel protein sources and look at the impact of uh, perhaps processing those sources on that. And the data that's starting to emerge is quite promising. This is just some of our data working with an industrial uh, collaborator, um, looking at um, the digestibility of two plant sources. We've got uh, uh, pea and rice protein, comparing it with the, the milk protein whey. Perhaps not surprisingly, the blue line there shows how whey on the left hand side into the total protein digestibility is highly digestible, quite rapidly digested to a high level. Uh, this is measured by just measuring the free amino groups, the nitrogen groups which are released as the proteins digested. But equally, the pea protein looks very digestible as well. Well, on the other hand, we see that rice is, has significant problems in terms of digestibility, uh, and this is similar to what, what, what's seen in in vivo models as well, and uh, is much is much less digested. But we can go one step further with our in vitro method and actually measure the specific digestibility of individual amino acids. And you can see for some of them, these compare quite well. So if you look at uh, leucine and lysine, all three sources are looking quite good. But in others, we get very different results. Uh, methionine, for example, very, very poor digestion for the rice in particular. So by doing this and using this as a screening tool, we can look at uh, uh, the, the digestibility of individual uh, plant sources and other sources. We can look at ways of processing them and see if we can improve that digestibility. And we can look at blending them together to try and get the, the maximum potential uh, amount of digestible uh, individual amino acids. So what are we working on? Well, we're working on a variety of sources. Uh, in terms of plants, we're particularly interested in alternative crops, which have perhaps been used for many centuries in parts of the world which have particular problems with protein availability and seeing whether we can help to make these into a, a greater proportion of the uh, protein which is meeting their requirements. And two examples I've got here are wing bean and uh, Bambara groundnut, both of which have been used, uh, have been consumed by humans for, as I say, for many centuries, have some particular strengths, particularly uh, in tolerating uh, uh, adverse uh, climatic situations, tend to be rich in a range of uh, nutrients as well as protein, but also have some challenges, particularly in terms of digestibility and the presence of, of, of anti-nutritional factors. And in working with these, and this wing bean in particular, my colleagues in Future Protein are looking at um, selective breeding, cross-breeding different strains of, 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 of uh, these plants to try and improve not only the total protein content, but trying to lower the anti-nutritional content, as well as improve the general growing uh, 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 the, the agricultural uh, requirements of it and, and, and increasing the yield that we can get from these things. But on top of that, also working with colleagues, particularly in Malaysia at our campus there, looking at uh, processing and in this case, potentially the use of fermentation to reduce the amount of these anti-nutrients and therefore improve the quality of the protein. We're working on single cell organisms. Uh, one you know very well, most of us know very well on the left hand side there, corn is actually a fungus, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, already seen as quite a good source of protein, quite bioavailable and quite a good range of essential amino acids. But we're working to see whether we can further use non-genetic manipulation techniques to enhance the composition of uh, that, uh, the, the, the ingredient there, the fungus which is included in it. Also working on algae, uh, spirulina is one that some of you may have seen. It tends to be sold as a health supplement to a certain extent, but again, when we look at the essential amino acid bioavailability, we see that uh, compared to where there are certain amino acids which really do not 
um, are, are not particularly bioavailable. Can we process this further to improve that? And again, working with our colleagues in the food industry, can we blend different sources of protein to try and produce a better quality, more bioavailable source? The other single cell organism we're particularly interested in is bacteria. And perhaps that's not something we immediately think about in terms of being a protein source. And I think we're probably some way away from people eating large amounts of bacterial protein and feeling comfortable with doing that. But it is a potential source of protein for the animal feed industry. And indeed, already there is a growing industry in using bacteria as a source of protein in fish farming, for example. Uh, it is a generally a good source of protein. It compares well with fish meal. A fish meal, of course, is just wild caught fish, which is ground up and fed to farmed fish, which is one of the most unsustainable processes that you can perhaps imagine. It compares well with insects, which uh, I will talk about uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, and it has a good amino acid composition in terms of uh, the essential amino acid composition, as you can see on the graph on the bottom there. The picture on the left shows uh, our laboratory scale uh, fermenters and uh, perhaps just highlights some of the technical problems that are being overcome to try and scale this up to be, be able to produce protein safely um, uh, and at uh, the scale that would be needed to start to replace things like fish meal and indeed to replace soy as an animal feed. And that, that there is progress being made in this area. And one particularly exciting um, bacterial species that we've been looking at is a carbon dioxide fixing species, which will physically take carbon dioxide out, out, out of the atmosphere and incorporate it into protein. Some way to go with this, we, uh, we're doing some in vitro studies of digestion at the moment. Um, we will be, be doing some fish studies hopefully so, soon, and ultimately we hope to uh, look at this as a, as a feed for, uh, for poultry as well. The last area I want to concentrate on a little more detail is uh, edible insects. And there's been an awful lot of interest in this and uh, the press seem to particularly like the stories relating to this. Uh, there's the so-called yuck factor, uh, people um, uh, that, that, that almost challenge to try and eat an insect to see whether they, they, can, they can like it. Um, and indeed, just by pure coincidence, if you look at The Guardian this morning, there's a specific story about the potential for uh, edible insects uh, helping to solve some of those problems in Africa that I've already already had highlighted uh, based on a World Bank report which came out at the end of last year. We recently reviewed the use of insects in both uh, feed and uh, as food and if anybody is interested the uh, reference is at the bottom of the page there and really highlighted eight species which have been looked at in detail. Uh, some larvae such as the mealworm, black soldier fly larvae, uh, house fly maggots and uh, and so on. And then the, uh, the, the full insects, the crickets in particular. Now crickets very much have been one of the major interests in terms of uh, a food directly for people. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, already we're often told that about two billion people in the world eat insects, uh, but how much of their protein requirement that actually meets I suspect is relatively small. But crickets seem to have been the one which has taken off the most in terms of uh, a direct food for people, uh, not just whole crickets, but producing what we call cricket flour, which essentially is just dried and ground up crickets, like a high protein flour type, which can be then incorporated into, the, into a whole range of different foods, such as noodles and the like. Um, mealworms are also uh, seen in the human diet, but uh, larvae in particular, there's a lot of interest in the various larvae as um, as animal feed. The graph there just shows you the amino acid composition, specifically the essential amino acid composition uh, compared to soya, which is right at the end. Uh, some variation, but in generally these would all be regarded as high quality protein in terms of the amino acid uh, composition. And certainly uh, our preliminary work suggests that they're relatively digestible as well. Much of our work with insects to date has focused on them as animal feed. Uh, some years ago now, I did some work with colleagues in Malaysia uh, with uh, uh, an organisation called Crops the Future on a project funded by the British Council, where we took the waste from one of the underutilised crops we were using, I think this was Moringa, 
and we fed that waste to uh, black soldier fly larvae. Then we took the black soldier fly larvae and produced a meal and put it into the feed that were being fed, was being fed to uh, sea bass. Uh, obviously, there's a big um, fish farming industry in Southeast Asia. Um, and we tried to replace increasing amounts of fish meal with this insect meal. And what we found was that we could get up to about 50% replacement of the fish meal before it started affecting the growth of the fish statistically significantly. So we've got variety of growth um, indices in the table there. Um, but after 50%, we got slower growth and we started to see higher mortality in the fish. But that's still a significant amount of wild fish which could be removed from uh, the, food the, the food chain um, if, we if we were to replace it. And we're actively trying to work out at the moment what it is over 50%. Is it specific nutrient deficiencies or are there anti-nutritional factors associated with this source that uh, would need to be overcome? More recently, uh, work we're just writing up at the moment, uh, we've looked at uh, the use of mealworms in, uh, in chicken feed. As you can see the picture at the top, they actually loved it uh, and actually we, we, we ground up the mealworms and added them to their feed uh, and they were actively trying to seek out the little the bits of mealworms that they, they, they liked it so much. These mealworms were fed on wheat bran, which is a relatively low value uh, product. And it's not often we see a result as clear as this in that the growth curves for the meal, the, the mealworm fed and the, um, the control fed uh, are absolutely identical, as you can see. This was a relatively modest replacement. We replaced 10% of the soya. We're working carefully, uh, obviously, to ensure that we don't that, that, that we, we, we're sure that, uh, it, that it's meeting the needs of the birds. Just a very brief mention of the, the graph on the other side, and this is something that we, we looked at. We looked at the microbiome, the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract of the birds and found that even just adding 10% mealworms considerably changed uh, the nature of that microbiome, increasing the numbers of some bacteria, decreasing the others. We're busy working through this at the moment, trying to decide which are favorable and which are, are adverse. But this does highlight uh, something that we have to be aware of, that when we change uh, the nature of our diet, we have to be aware that we're, that we're changing other things rather than just purely the nutritional value of it. Potentially here we're seeing an effect on the microbiome and increasingly we understand the importance of our microbiome in terms of health. Uh, we don't think that is bacteria which are coming from the insects, by the way. We think it's uh, it may well be the chitin, the, the, the skeleton of uh, the insects, which is having this impact on uh, the growth of different uh, bacteria. So the last thing I want to very briefly uh, just talk about is some of the work we're doing on trying to improve the efficiency. Uh, we know a lot about improving efficiency of traditional livestock. Uh, we've had decades of trying to maximize the growth of things like pigs and chickens and cattle, uh, largely through selective breeding, uh, and we can do that in insects as well. We've also done it by manipulating the diet, though in our traditional livestock that tends to, that's tended to be using very high quality feeds. And that's exactly what we don't want to do with our insects. We want to feed them on relatively poor feeds, uh, which are more sustainable, but we can still look at the impact of different dietary uh, components. We could use growth promoters as is used in many parts of the world in livestock. And I'll show you some examples of how we can do that in insects. Obviously, we have to be sure it's safe. There's regulation to consider, and I, I hope I imagine uh, some of my audience are very uh, familiar with uh, with that. Um, even more uh, contentious, we could use genetic manipulation. Would it be acceptable to the public? Would it be safe? And there's all the regulatory things. Are there other things we can do? So just one very brief example. This is uh, some experiments we've recently done where we've treated uh, insects with something called juvenile, juvenile hormone, a specific insect hormone, a steroid hormone. And the incredible thing about insects is all we have to do is sprinkle it onto their feed and they absorb this hormone and it has direct effects on their metabolism. As far as we know, it uh, doesn't have any major impact on mammalian systems uh, and we're not aware of any safety issues, but obviously there's a long way to go improving that. Uh, but what we found on the left hand side, as you can see, our treated uh, insects grew substantially, but they also changed in composition. We saw a marked increase in protein, which we see is a good thing. 
and a decrease in the fat content, as we see in a good thing. Uh, juvenile hormone is already used as an insecticide in some, in some parts of the world to stop insects maturing and reproducing. So it's already produced uh, at a large scale and it's already now an environment. And as I say, we've not seen any evidence of any adverse effects, but we could use this uh, growth promoter to increase the growth of, of insects. However, we'd like to go one step further and use this ability of insects to absorb things from uh, their environment, from their feed, by using something called RNA interference technology. So insects can actually absorb double-stranded RNA directly from their gastrointestinal tract by eating it and absorbing it and allowing us to use that specifically to regulate their gene expression. We have a grant application in at the moment, which we are waiting with our fingers crossed to see whether we get funded to take our work with juvenile hormone, identify the genes that that juvenile hormone is actually regulating, and then target those genes with this double-stranded RNA and getting these insects to specifically uh, uh, to regulate the expression of these genes in these insects with this to uh, change their growth and hopefully to mimic that increase in protein and that decrease in fat. This is a transient effect. It's not a genetic, uh, it wouldn't be seen as a GM effect. We can remove the RNA at any time and they go back to their normal growth. We have no reason to believe it would have any detrimental impact on whatever eats it, whether that is uh, our livestock, our, our chickens, or our fish, or indeed people, but obviously that has to be researched further. The alternatives, of course, is we could go down more conventional routes. We could go down using something called CRISPR, which many of you will be familiar with, which is a, a knockout, uh, a gene knockout system, which is, can be used in mammals, or we could go down a full GM track. But we feel this is an attractive way which might be more acceptable. So in terms of insects specifically, Again, there's an awful lot going back to what I showed you for, 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 for alternative protein generally. We're looking at the nutrition, the bioavailability. We're looking at ways of making it more uh, afford, uh, affordable in trying to in, improve the efficiency by maximizing the growth of the insects. Uh, a lot of interest in the insect industry, if you like, in obviously the big question is scale up, getting our production of insects to a high enough level to make it commercially viable whether that's for human food or even, even, even more difficult in many ways to compete with traditional sources of protein for animal feed. We'd like it to be sustainable using non-human edible uh, um, um, sources of, uh, of food for the insects themselves, ideally uh, uh, with our waste. Obviously, uh, paramount is the safety. Uh, there are allergenicity uh, concerns. People do become allergic to insects uh, in countries where they're, where they're consumed frequently. Um, we, we still uh, need to be sure that uh, whether the insects are capable of passing on, passing on pathogens through our, through, our, through our food systems and indeed also accumulating uh, potentially dangerous chemicals as well. So some work still, lots of work still to be done in some aspects. And ultimately, will people eat them? Uh, or if they won't eat them, will they eat animals which have been fed on them? And uh, there's a move, I think, within uh, the, uh, the general population to accept that insects might be part of our food systems. As I say, if not for direct consumption, that perhaps they would accept that they are a natural part in some ways of, of animal diets and we could use them more effectively. That just really brings me on to talk about uh, the uh, where we are in terms of regulation, specifically in insects, um, things are moving and things are moving in Europe. Of course, that's not us anymore. Uh, and very recently, in September last year, there was specific approval of using protein from a variety of larvae in the feeds of chicken and pigs. And even more recently, just earlier this month, um, the uh, Commission, European Commission authorised the use of cricket powder as a food. Um, where that leaves us in the UK, I don't know. This is not my area of expertise at all. I have asked some colleagues in the Food Standards Agency whether they could tell me whether this is being considered at the moment. I don't know whether there's anybody who's listening who, who has more information, but obviously things are moving. Uh, there's a, a emerging insect uh, industry in the UK and hopefully 
we may be able to follow follow suit to a certain extent and join our colleagues in Europe in uh, permitting some of these things to start to enter our food chain. So in conclusion, we produce enough protein in the world to feed everybody, but we don't distribute it equally and our production systems are certainly not sustainable and are having a, a, an adverse effect on the uh, on the environment, which really has to be addressed quite urgently. Animal derived foods are an important source of high quality protein, but their production has a major impact on the environment, and particularly through methane production on climate change. For many high income countries, protein consumption could be reduced without any detrimental effect on health. But in doing that, uh, my caution at the beginning is let, let's just make sure we don't have any inadvertent effects on most vulnerable groups. And I highlighted in particular the elderly and ensuring that they continue have, to have uh, the, uh, a source of high quality protein to meet their increased demands. Alternative and more sustainable protein sources are needed for both human consumption and for animal feed. Uh, that includes underutilized crops, it includes in single cell organisms, and it includes insects. However, we still have a way to go to fully understand their nutritional value, how to, their sustain, how to produce them sustainably, uh, their, their, their safety impact, and how to scale up these industries to try and replace some of the, uh, the, the protein sources which are currently damaging uh, our environmental systems. Thank you very much. Uh, a large number of acknowledgements for everybody involved in the uh, Future Protein Platform and those associated with it. On the left hand side, I have all my um, academic colleagues at the University of Nottingham. In the middle there, our postdocs and our PhD students who are doing a lot of the work. Um, I haven't been able to, uh, to talk about all of their work and I apologise to them for not being able to fit it all in. Obviously, uh, a lot to get through. And on the right hand side, I just want to give a particular shout out to all our technical staff who have done an amazing job in trying to keep our research going in the most difficult two years that any of us have seen, I think, in terms of, uh, of uh, all sorts of aspects of our lives with, with the pandemic. So thank you to everybody involved. And final slide here, as you can see, just uh, to say thanks and to acknowledge uh, the uh, input from our funders, whether they be uh, government funders, um, the, uh, I've been involved in uh, some workshops organised by the Rockefeller Foundation and the World Wildlife Fund, uh, Crops for the Future, another charity uh, was say, based in Malaysia, and then some of our, our industrial funders, AB Agri and Animal Feed Company, Quorn, you're all well aware of, Monkfield are a major insect producer, and uh, Herbalife, of course, are a major plant protein um, um, food uh, company. So thank you very much. I'll try my best to answer any questions that have come in. But as I say, you're also welcome to contact me if you want anything else. Thank you, Karen. Sorry, I tried to keep it down, but uh, absolutely, absolutely not. not. Sorry, sorry. sorry to send feedback. We, send. we could see you were running over a little bit, but it was so interesting. We didn't want to stop you. So you. Uh, there is already some questions. Um, I'm sure some people are still digesting all the information you've been giving. So, so I'll start with some questions more about uh, the crops. Uh, someone mentioned the work on the um, um, variety of maize, QPM, is very interesting. This maize appears to have been available for some time, but seemingly not widely taken up, even though it doesn't have the perceived negative of uh, genetically modified uh, varieties. What are the barriers to more widespread growing of this crop? I think, I mean, it has, I mean, I, I can't remember. I mean, Mexico is one of the countries that, that, that comes to mind, but there are a couple of African countries that have adopted it as well. It's just physically getting, I think, to the level of farmers in some of these poorer countries and getting the, you know, you, you're going to have to subsidise it to a certain extent to get it into, into the system in the first place. Uh, and I think there's just been a resistance in that. Obviously, we're talking about very poor countries which don't have the, the structures in their agricultural systems that perhaps we have. But I really hope, I mean, it, it's not the overall solution. I don't want anybody to think it is. That, that It had a significant impact, but we need to increase the variety of proteins that these countries have available as well. Hopefully not relying too much on animal-based proteins like the rest of us do. But um, I think it's just politics and the physical system which has been the problem. Obviously, you have to prove that it can grow under the, under the various conditions, but I think so far it has been shown to grow in quite 
a diverse number of, of, of countries. So I think there is promise there. And I really hope because it, say it's been around for, for quite a long time, I think decades now. And I really hope that uh, we can maybe push and perhaps our paper will do a small amount to show that there is value in doing this. So a couple more questions related to crop. What proportion of crops and pasture is used for non-food producing animals? So that would be that, I suppose. It's an excellent question. I'm not sure I can answer it directly here. I'll go away and try and do some uh, some searching on that. Um, relatively small compared to the amount which is being used by, by, by food producing animals, I think. Uh, obviously, most of our pets uh, are uh, reliant on animal based foods themselves. I mean, certainly into when we're looking at both cats and dogs. So I can't put a figure on it, but I mean, much, much smaller, I believe, than obviously that which is going into the um, um, the, the, the food stuff. system. Perhaps colleagues in the pet industry would be able to tell me that a lot, lot, lot better <laughs> than I've answered that. And is the land on which crops to feed livestock are grown also suitable for growing human plant protein source? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, and I mean, one of the reasons that is given uh, that for maintaining the, uh, the, 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 the ruminant um, production we've got, the cows and the sheep, is that often, particularly with sheep, for example, they're feeding on land where we couldn't grow anything, uh, yes. anything else. Uh, a lot of the land that, I mean, obviously, for when we move into monogastric species, and I'm talking about pigs and chickens, a lot of the feed they're eating is already human edible food. They're being fed on soy, that land is being used. We don't really want to see much more land cleared, particularly in uh, tropical forests for, for soya production, but that soya could be diverted or the land could be used for producing other perhaps beans and pulses uh, or already. Um, in terms of uh, other crops, I think there is some concern. I mean, particularly, I mean, I mentioned Eat Lancer and I didn't want to concentrate on that. Uh, those of you who know it would know that it was quite a dramatic suggestion of a change that we reduce our meat, our, our red and processed meat to 14 grams a day, but we dramatically increase our beans and pulses and nuts to 125 grams per day. Whether that land can be used to produce nuts, for example, which often need an awful lot of water, uh, I'd have to leave to the agriculturalists, but I know there is concern. So, but I'd just go back to the point that one of the points I was making was a lot of the crops we're growing for animal production are human edible crops already, so they could just be diverted. That leads quite nicely to a, a comment from Paul. I suppose the problem with spare feeding people to replace animal protein sources with nuts and seeds is that they are also high in oils and fats or what they are, which cuts across messages people in the UK need to lose weight. Yeah, so, I mean, certainly some of them are. Obviously, they can be processed. We can use that oil in, in, in other ways, not just in the food industry, but in, in other, other forms of industry. That gets us to another question and obviously there's a lot of antagonism towards food processing uh, and uh, we, we hear a lot about ultra processed food. I'm not sure we all really know what ultra processed means, but processing came in for a reason into our food systems and that was to make in general to make foods more nutritious to get rid of things like anti-nutritional factors to enrich the protein fraction and reduce the reduce the, the lipid. We see it, we're seeing an awful lot of what I would call meat mimetics or meat analogues, the, 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 the veggie burgers, if you like, or so, with soy and, and, and pea. They're very processed foods. They have a lot more ingredients than the, the beef version of them do and what have you. And it's going to be interesting at what stage the, the, the consumer recognises these as processed foods or not. But I think it's inevitable. Some of these foods will have to be processed both to make them more nutritious and as that comment quite rightly makes, take the good bits out and maybe not ensure we're not adding even more fat into the diet, which could contribute to the obesity problem as well as uh, cardiovascular disease and things like that. Yeah, I think, uh, and Paul, Paul kept on the same line a bit later on. Yeah, he mentioned the efforts to improve the bioavailability of proteins in plants and other non-animal sources. Looks like they can only be used as ingredients in processed food products, not directly used as ingredients by the general public. So I think, yeah, it comes back to that, really. Um, there was a 
question about uh, the elderly demographic. Do all the people over 65 absorb or simply eat less digestible protein? It's an interesting question and, and it, there's, there's multiple factors. We know we need pro protein, we need the amino acids in protein because our body tissues are turning over all the time, our muscle tissues are turning over all the time. We're losing amino acids from our muscle and we're replacing them with, 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 with dietary amino acids. It seems that that process is less efficient as we get older, probably due to a range of things, maybe insulin resistance and what have you, and they're not as effective. Also, to do that, we need to combine um, dietary intake with exercise, which help, which, which uh, speeds up that, 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 that change. So that's one factor. So increasing exercise and increasing intake uh, is one thing. But equally, that is set against a range of problems in many elderly people. Uh, as we all know, appetite tends to go down. We don't want to eat as much. Often we have physical and uh, with the rise in dementia, mental problems in terms of people's ability to prepare and to consume food. Perhaps the most vulnerable are in care homes. And there's a, an argument to look very carefully at the food that we're feeding, uh, particularly those with, with dementia in care homes and see whether we can improve the quality of that protein. And you know that, that could well be one area where we could make some real improvements in, in terms of that without necessarily increasing dramatically the amount of, uh, of animal protein. I think, again, I think many elderly people find that their ability to consume large amounts of meat or whatever is, is reduced due to a reduced appetite. So multiple factors there, but it is one of our most vulnerable demographics that we really have to just be aware of, I think. So linked to nutrition, James asked, on most food packaging, is the protein listed a total amount or is there any consideration for protein digestibility? As far as I'm aware at the moment, it's total amount because there hasn't been a reliable way of measuring that digestibility. Um, we might be getting somewhere to that with our in vitro system, but obviously we were somewhere from, from being categorical about that. But perhaps there should be something about, the, you know, uh, some traffic light system or something about the quality of the protein, the digestibility rather than absolute amounts, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And Ryan asks, what impact, if any, do you envisage emerging research vis-a-vis -vis digestion and absorption of nutrients through microbiome gut in humans we love on your work? I suppose that came at the time where you were speaking about the impact of eating insects on the microbiome uh, of uh, the birds. Yes. I mean, obviously, this is one of the fastest moving areas in nutritional science. Our, our, our recognition that, um, you know, for many years we thought once it got past the small intestine, nutrition was over. But what's going on in, in, in the large intestine uh, of, of what, what the my, my microbial population is doing there, we can absorb some of that. They're having direct impacts on not just on nutrition, but on our general health. And I think I only put that up to show almost potential unintended consequences. If we change our diet dramatically, we see these changes. And as I say, we're going through all of those phyla of bacteria at the moment trying to say, right, is that a good thing that that's increased or is it a bad thing that, 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 that that's decreased and so on? And I think it's just one thing we have to take into account now. We know the microbiome is important in maintaining our health. Anything we do in our food system, I think we, we now are obliged to see whether we're having an effect. And that was a, a mo relatively modest amount of insect as well. That was 10% of the uh, the soya free plain, mm -hmm. having quite a dramatic effect. We believe, as I say, we, we think it may well be the chitin because chitin isn't well digested. It probably gets into the colon and the bacteria may be doing something with that. Um, what do mealworms eat on the other insects? Probably they are more efficient processing the food they eat. Yeah, I mean, in terms of producing protein for the animal feed industry, probably the biggest interest has been in black soldier fly larvae because they are the most, um, they, they eat a vast diverse amount of food. Uh, they'll even uh, consume uh, farm animal excrement. Now whether that's, and, and that is allowed in some parts of the world, it's not allowed uh, in, uh, in, in, in the UK or Europe or, or North America, I believe. But so, it's, <laughs> so there's a, a lot of interest in black soldier fly larvae because they'll eat such a wide range of things. Mealworms are different. They tend to like dry food, but there is potential. Um, 
Wheat bran, for example, was one of the things that, that, that we've been looking at. Uh, there's a very, very big insect producer in uh, in France, the insect who we've had some contact with, and they're looking at, at using a, a sort of crop waste and, and things like wheat bran. Uh, but then there's human non-animal based human waste. I mean, things like Brewers waste, brewers yeast, and things like that could be a could be could be a source. So the variety of things we can look at, um, and particularly if they're going into the directly into the human food chain, we I think those are the sort of foods we would have to look at. Uh, but we're looking at you know we're trying to look look, look at this diverse bread waste is one of the things we've been thinking about. One of the things that's wasted in households the most is bread, and certainly uh, mealworms will, will consume that. But how how you make that economically viable to collect that and perhaps dry it a little bit and what have you are some of the things that we're very interested in looking at. Um, a comment from Jean, more comment than a question really. My family are dairy farmers and my brother ordered some soya yesterday and the price which has already high has gone up massively just recently. Now 465 pound per ton up by over 100 pound per ton from the normal price. So there's definitely a, a need to have some uh, Maybe I yeah. wouldn't say in house, but at least inland production. Yeah. Of no, that, that, I agree with that. And I mean, that's we've seen that happen with fish meal as well. Fish meal has increased year on year and forced the uh, the um, fish farming industry really to look at look alternatives to using wild caught fish meal. And Dean also commented that uh, the restrictions on what animals can be fed on insects uh, come from ABP and TSE regs, which are DEFRA and APA. APHR responsibility, not FSA. That's useful to know. Uh, so that might be something you want to look into. Um, I am really sorry. Someone made a comment saying horses in particular, and I'm afraid I have not seen it, so I don't know what it relates to in terms of timing in your talk. Uh, and at the moment, yet yeah, we do have more. Do we have evidence as to the awareness in the general public about the feed? used to provide their meat? Um, probably not. I mean, I think there is a, a sec, a, a, perhaps a growing section of, uh, of um, the population who are showing more and more interest in this uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what have you. Obviously, uh, there has always been a small proportion of the population who have uh, concentrated on organic food rightly or wrongly and what have you and uh, and what, what is being consumed. But I think there is a, an educational process there to a certain extent so people understand it more. Um, we've done some very small uh, consumer type studies and in general those people who we've actually uh, talked to are quite in favour of something like insects as an animal feed, uh, particularly when we, we're using them so much for wild, as wild bird feed and things like that. Obviously bringing it directly into the human food chain, uh, there's, a, there's a more diverse response to a certain extent. But th th there's a definite need for further education. But I think obviously there's a growing awareness of our, the impact of our food systems on, on the environment. Uh, and that's going to get bigger and bigger as, uh, as, as the urgency uh, increases. Thank you. And there was a reaction to our discussion on processed and ultra processed food earlier. As you say, ultra processed is a somewhat meaningless title. Can we use alternative proteins to rewrite the terminology and remove some of these negative connotations and hurdles? I, I, would, I would love that. I mean, again, it's, it's education. Uh, you, 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 it's just been vilified. I mean, you just use this term ultra processed and people automatically think it's bad. If we didn't, pro I mean, heating is the most basic form of processing. And not, but I know that, but putting large amounts of saturated fat, large amounts of simple sugar into, into our food is obviously a bad thing. But I think that we need a better understanding of the needs of processing and the different types of processing that go into the food, into our food systems. And uh, there is a question, which is the last at the moment. Do you think allergy is going to be a significant problem if insects enter the food chain? Can it be dealt with by labeling or will it be a safety problem that prevents a novel food being approved? That's from Sue. No, I think it will be addressed by labeling. Everything we've seen so far suggests it's a little bit like the level of allergy problems perhaps we see with seafood. It might actually be the, exactly the same allergy problems. Again, it might be related to some of the proteins or the chitin which is associated with seafood. Um, but we, 
we, we've had some student projects with some of our students who come from uh, countries where insects are uh, more commonly eaten and uh, some of the surveys they did did show that people do have reactions to them like they do to virtually every food that we consume so I don't think it's any different I don't think it's going to be significantly higher necessarily but obviously labeling will be critical and uh, you know it's absolutely essential that if, if, if uh, foods get into the directly into the human food system it needs to be labeled as this contains insects or whatever I think. And at the moment, that's all the questions we have. We have uh, many thanks and congratulations on your talk, which we will pass you in, in private after the talk. Thank I you. want to thank you again very much for such an interesting talk and thanks to all our attendees, uh, particularly those who stayed as we uh, exceeded our time. Um, thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy and I will see you soon. Thank you very much and thank you to everybody for listening.